So, okay, we don't need to introduce Chip again if you don't know him by now. Um, but I, I do, and I think most of these people on this panel hardly need any introduction. But uh, just even in doing a little bit of research for the panel, I learned a few things. So Gabby, in addition to being a neighbor, uh, of course, is a champion volley a beach volleyball player and TV personality, the first female athlete to design a Nike uh, shoe, and uh, the first ever female cross-training spokesperson for Nike. Gabby is also author of the New York Times best-selling book, uh, My Foot is Too Big for the Glass Slipper. Um, I, I'm an eight, Gabby. I don't know if you threw that out already, but I'll take it if you still. Hey, that's like child's play. <laughs> uh, as a model, uh, she's appeared on the covers of Elle, Shape, Outside, Life, just to name a few. Um, she's starred on multiple TV series, iconic commercials, and most recently, uh, you created High HX, a high-intensity explosive training and conditioning program, as well as extreme performance training, uh, which incorporates your unique water workouts, which I've heard a bit about from my uh, our mutual friend, Randy Wallace. Oh. <laughs> Big Ayn Randy. That explains a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Randy Wallace. Look him up. Um, yeah. So, and he's out of town, so otherwise he would have definitely wanted to be here. Uh, Joe DeSena, uh, founder of and CEO of Spartan, the world's largest obstacle race and endurance brand, started life uh, in Queens, always had a business, had a fireworks business, then had a pool business, uh, at one point I think had 750 um, customers, narrowly escaped, maybe getting sucked into the mob, um, made his way to Cornell, which is a story even in and of itself. Um, so the mob thing, yeah, didn't do that, but he decided to go to Wall Street instead. So that, that's going to be interesting. Wall, Wall Street picked up a few not so great habits and said, this is not for me. And he ended up uh, launching a fitness empire um, and the, creating the Spartan lifestyle with more than 250 events across more than 40 countries. Spartan has had heats for all different age groups and uh, all different ages. Now, we are definitely going to want to hear your lockdown story, Joe, um, because if ever there is an industry that has been uh, impacted and, and, and would you know deserve bailouts, that would be, I, I could use a bailout right yeah, now. I'll yeah, break right. all the rules. Right. Send me, send me money. No, but you know what? No, but that's what the, that you know when you are shut down by a lockdown. Like you do live events. Like if you're in the idea business, like no, we don't we don't deserve um, bailouts. Okay, and his books, all of which I have read, definitely, which should be part of one of our future book clubs: Spartan Up, Spartan Fit, and The Spartan Way. Uh, and of course, Laird Hamilton uh, is the world's best big wave surfer. Um, and the co-inventor of toe in surfing for massive waves. Uh, I didn't know this. He was born in an experimental salt water sphere at UCSF. Uh, so there really Explains actually a lot. It is. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you that. Yeah, an Aquaman um, is Aquaman is real. You can't make this stuff up. Uh, it's true. Uh, so he grew up surfing in Hawaii, similar to his fellow panelist, Chip, uh, kind of felt like he didn't always um, fit in. Uh, he is known around Malibu as uh, one of the most down-to-earth, friendliest guys. Of course, he is also uh, known globally as uh, a pioneer in water sports, um, the uh, inventor of toe and surfing, uh, essentially the inventor of modern stand-up paddling, and then also, like our honoree tonight, has constantly innovated with materials um, for foil boards and, and strap-ons and all, you know, kite surfing and all different kinds of things. He's, um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is, this is the, the, uh, the, the, the R-rated, the R uh, did, we did say that. Your brains just go right like there. Yeah. Better, yeah. All, these in, all this intelligence and you right. go right to the gutter. Just because LGBTQ for Liberty is like sponsoring us, I don't know, you guys get your minds out of the gutter, okay? So anyway, uh, so he's written a couple of books, Force of Nature, 
um, and more, more recently, Life Rider, Heart, Body, Soul, and Life Beyond the Ocean. And we do want to learn more about this. But first, Chip, I yes. wanted to ask you a little bit about your, <laughs> your dust up, okay, that you had with Lululemon and when you decided to put uh, Who is John Galt on your iconic Lululemon bags, you were a little surprised at the result. You didn't think like objectivism and yoga seemed like connected to you, but not to everybody. Tell us about what happened and what your takeaway was. Okay, so um, we had a, my target audience for Lou Lemon was a 32-year-old professional woman and well-educated, well-traveled, fashionable, on the ball. And I, I loved Atlas Shrugged and I loved Dagny Taggart and I thought, well, there's not probably that many people that know about Atlas Shrug, and I and I kind of felt like maybe it was losing its, um, uh, you know, the aura around it, and the number of people that had, had had read it. So then I decided that I was going to put this on the side of our shopper, Lou Lemon Shopping Bag, who is John Galt, and it just didn't. It's I thought only the only like the cream of the crop of these educated women would really get it. But because they would love it, I thought that that was like, well, sponsoring a, a wonderful athlete. So, but, you know, our board of directors, who was much older and scared and full of fear, um, didn't see it that way. And it created a massive division in our board of directors and actually wasn't really good for either Lou Lemon or its customers in the long run. Well, I also like to say that, um, you know, ahisma is the Vedic term for non-harming. It's essentially the non-aggression principle, as, of course, libertarians in the audience would know. Uh, and, of course, it is the principle of yoga. Um, and it's just a coincidence that ahisma also happens to contain the letters A is A. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, Gabby and Laird, so you two, uh, when you met, you had many things in common. Obviously, you're athletic, blonde, <laughs> blonde the beach. tall, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, and your athletic careers. But another thing, again, that I learned that you had in common in terms of that early on in life, you two were kind of uh, on your own. Gabby, you lost your father. A uh, Trinidadian in a plane crash when you were five, and Laird, you were also fatherless until the age of three. You essentially set your mother up yeah, with your fixed future. my mom up. Yeah. Yeah. So I needed um, somebody. And the guy was handsome. <laughs> that was uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, so, in you you did have to kind of fend for yourself. So, is there a way in which that maybe shaped your approach in life, your ideas, and maybe also that? independence kind of primed you to uh, like when you came across it, Atlas Shrug? Well, it's funny. Someone gave me Atlas Shrug when I was 14. I had a friend. He is still my friend, Peter Richardson. He's 10 years older than I am. And he thought he he thought I fancied myself as pretty smart. And he's like, oh, you're really smart. And he gave me that book. And I remember um, it deeply impacting me. But as far as you know, I believe that um, I was an only child and, and not having a father, a tremendous amount of stability in your home, I, I would just remember thinking early that there was a lot of people around me, whether they were teachers and then eventually coaches and other people who were willing to step in for me. Um, it sort of made me pay attention to being grateful for the things that were working, but also I, I've said this many times, I think we're all given high cards and low cards. And if we can really pay attention to the high cards and understand what those are and understand who we are and maybe what we have to contribute and, and um, something that we, that feels like a natural extension for, of us to develop those things. Um, that just seemed like a pretty good way to go. And, and so I, even though I don't think we understand all of the things that happen in our lives, especially when we're younger, it's uh, all of the things that can shape us to this sort of maybe positive place or push us into the place that we're supposed to you know, I always say we're kind of portals, temporary portals for things, and just that we can be good stewards of our of that portal. Lover, am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> you have, you're very you're very compelling, Larry. 
You are? The, um, well, first of all, I, uh, if there wasn't any pictures in the books, um, I usually don't look at them. Um, <laughs> but I will say uh, so that I was fortunate that, my, that I had an incredible mother. And she read me um, when I was very young. And I think that's probably what led to my lack of wanting to read because she read so well. And all I had to do was sit there and listen. It's like audible. Um, and so she, uh, she read me some books when I was young, um, like Jonathan Livingston Siegel and uh, Lord of the Rings and some of these other books that really were uh, Dune. Um, and these books were can very... Uh, imagination uh, building and and built my belief and my mom was su uh, supportive in that you could do anything and that that um, but you had to be a good person and so that was the that was kind of the law and my mom really didn't know I surfed um, she was just more concerned about what kind of manners I had and what kind of person I was and and uh, and I think that was something that you know I don't ever. I don't consider myself a surfer. I surf, but I'm not a surfer. I'm just a human, and so uh, I look at it that way. And but I had an amazing mother that that really made me build my imagination. I think um, you know Thomas Edison said, uh, "All you need to be an inventor is an imagination and a pile of junk." And uh, and I definitely have a pile of junk and uh, and maybe some imagination at times. So, but that's that's my my foundation. Joe, um, more than anyone on this panel, uh, you pioneered an industry that has to be one of the hardest uh, hit by the lockdowns and the quarantines. So tell us a bit about your 2020 story. Um, and were there any takeaways from reading Ayn Rand early on that helped you mentally prepare and helped you adapt and innovate during these very difficult times? Well, I'm, in, I'm cr incredibly optimistic, um, as we all are here, and I just wasn't buying it. I just wasn't. Um, we had closed down Japan. Uh, we had closed down China, but we're in 45 countries, so we still had, you know, 43 to go. <laughs> and I was in Sparta, Greece, for the lighting of the torch for the Olympics, and Trump shut the borders down. And I remember racing to get back home because my wife was going to kill me if I got stuck in Europe. And um, it became very real. Like, oh man, the whole world is gonna shut down. We've got employees all over the world. Um, registration revenue stopped overnight. And um, optimism went to planning. All right, what are we gonna do? The world's gonna be back up by July 1st. It's gotta be back up by July 1st. We gotta protect cash. We gotta protect our employees. We've gotta stay in touch with our customers. And, um, and I, I remember saying, all right, the standards don't change, right? So maybe that's something I got from the book. And so if I worked out every morning at 5 a.m., whether I went in the office or not, I was going to continue to work. Matter of fact, I was going to do four workouts a day instead of one now because I had a lot of free time. And, and um, we were going we to get everybody on the farm, the family, and get some videographers. And I just, I just became a maniac. And I, I wish I could sit here and say it worked. Um, it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> but we just keep doing workouts and acting like a maniac and hoping that Chip will bail us out or something. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. It's awful. I would, I'm, I'd be lying to you if I. But but you fight through. You know, it's not World War II and it's not the Spanish flu, and and uh, you get through it. Well, your your content has been incredibly creative, and you've kept us going. I mean, at the Atlas Society, because we we listen to you and we watch you and we follow you, and I'm like, I say to my staff. This is the way. This I was very way. convincing to a lot of people. <laughs> Behind the scenes, convinced. they did not know I was off the rails. <laughs> but but you're in the best shape of your life, so. <laughs> that resonates. Um, Gabby, so you've talked a bit about the unique challenges of, uh, that face female athletes. Um, something Chip here built an entire industry, a company around from a technical innovation uh, aspect, but I think you were talking more about expectations um, and cultural norms. You and Laird are raising three girls. What can parents do <laughs> to raise independent girls who, like the heroines of ha Ayn Rand's novels, uh, pursue their goals despite what expectations are culturally? 
Yeah, and I think it's an interesting time. Um, one of our daughters is, is sort of fully baked. She's an adult, so she, I, I don't, this, it doesn't impact her as much, but I will say like social media and the telephone and, you know, uh, control for their attention span and things like that, that is very worrisome. I know Larry would like to just drive his truck over all electronic <laughs> devices from time to time. I throw the phones. It's like, true. I get them and I throw them, but I always throw them in a place they land safely because I know if I break them, I got to go buy another one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty good about that. I just whip them. Oh, you threw my phone. But it landed like in a soft grass, not in the swimming pool where I really wanted to or underneath my car or in, yeah. underneath a hammer. It's true. And, and I think for us, the challenge is, you know, um, is just it's really the same it's being modeling what you are saying that's all you can do is ultimately at the end of the day they are you are still going to have the greatest impact on them especially in the first you know 12 to 13 years of their life before they sort of start to transfer over to friends and in, in certain ways and i think it's just about modeling them and encouraging them to understand what their own voice is but if i said to you that i had it figured out or that it was easy i, I would be totally lying um, it's a challenge every day, and I'm insecure, and I think I'm blowing it all the time. Um, but uh, as Larry reminds me, you know, you're there and you love them. And I think ultimately, if I can be a model, especially to three daughters, and also I have female friends around, that even if I don't resonate with them because I'm their mom, there's these women around them. So they're, you know, it's just reminding them, like, hey, this is your life. You're unique and special. It, success is when your outside life reflects who you are, not that you followed some idea that somebody put in front of you that that's what you had to do. So I think as long as we try to keep doing that um, and you know talk about like brush your teeth and put your dirty clothes in the laundry and say please and thank you, I think you have a fighting shot. But I think the entry of social media is a very interesting new challenge that um, I will be uh, comfortable with when I don't have to deal with it, for sure. Joe, you talked when you were recently, I think a lot of you up here have been on the Joe uh, Rogan show, right? Yeah. Um, so, hey, maybe we can put a plug in for him next year's Atlas Society. But um, you, Joe, on the show, you were talking about what you, the, the kind of camp that you ran for the kids. Sounded kind of extreme. But tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so, so sitting on the farm, doing social media, losing my mind, right? The whole world is shut down for us. I, I decided to start inviting uh, friends, kids over, over the house, over the farm. We're going to do a 14-day camp. And I don't know if you guys know this, but we put on a race every year called a death race. And it's, it's arguably one of the toughest challenges um, any civilian could do. And the kids came. And my friend grabbed the death race bibs, the jerseys, and put them on all the 20-something kids. And my mind changed. And it, immediately, I didn't even realize it, we, it became the death race. And I put these kids through 14 days of hell. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, to, to the point on, on the phones, was at night the kids would text home. I didn't know they were doing this. They'd get in bed. And they'd start texting him, Mom, you got to get me out of here. <laughs> this guy is an absolute nutcase. This, this is not a camp. He's tricked us all into being here. He's making us do farm work. And, and those messages got back to my wife. And my wife called me, screaming, what are you doing? We're going to have no friends. You need to release all the kids. And I said, no, we have to do this. We, our kids are going to finish. All these kids have to finish because we can't have, like, whispering around the neighborhood that 18 kids quit and our kids finished. They all have to finish. So it literally, it was like a union fight. The parents got together against me. I had to get a negotiator. But ultimately, all the kids finished 14 days, and they earned, I got them um, $13 plastic skulls from um, CVS. And it was, like they, it was like they won the lottery. They got these skulls. They wrote me thank you notes when it was all over. But it was, um, it was hell for 14 days for them and for me. It was awesome. You know what we should do, though? I think, hey, Peter Cobb says, I like this idea. Why don't we do another one of these, like Death Race, but we combine all of the things that you had them do, right? They had to, like, move boulders and all of this, and then we just drill Ayn Rand into them 24-7. Oh, you know? it was, ama kind of like it was amazing because situation. we would like give it. them poems and say, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's Man in the Arena. It's so easy for a child to remember those things while you're beating them like this. So we could definitely do that. We could play speakers for 14 like, yeah, days like on the farm. Anthem, totally. Yes. Okay. 
I like it. It's coming together. Okay. Um, for all of you guys. So, you know, I made reference to that quote before Ayn Rand talked about the creative man. She was talking about men. Um, being motivated by the desire to achieve, not to beat others. Um, but, okay, what motivates you guys? Because obviously a race, you know, you're it's a game. There are two teams. Um, but then there's yoga. So, like, to what extent does competition motivate you? And to what extent does just, hey, I decided I want to go conquer this wave motivate you? Anybody? All well, I, I can say for me personally, um, I'm not motivated by competition in any way. Um, I really haven't ever been. Uh, I I mean, that's I do lie. like... That's a lie. We I, were eating before, but, and I got another plate of salad, and you had to get one. See, you just turned it into something competitive. I just saw you had two, and I'm like, I need two, too. <laughs> I didn't say I needed three. <laughs> and you didn't say you needed a, a two-two. <laughs> but, but I, you know, for I, I guess I always... Because I, I, in my position, I've been more of a... Cre in creative, you know, they say that the creative man, of course, is fulfilled by accomplishing things, and the competitive man is fulfilled by beating others. Um, I do. It's not. I think some, in some ways, maybe I'm so competitive that I want to be creative to and be fulfilled by that, and not allow the comp uh, competitive thing to be able to dictate my feeling of accomplishment. I don't want that to. I don't want somebody else's lack of performance or performance to determine my fate. I'd rather just determine it by myself. I think it's kind of nice when you actually have control over your own happiness, like your feeling of accomplishment, where if you're relying on somebody else to, to you know, be worse than you, you could do really terribly, but they did even worse, and then you win, and I think that would be kind of, that seems weird. That's kind of insincere. Like, well, I won, but I sucked. You know, where I, I kind of like my, my thing, which is, you know, I want to do this thing, and I was able to ride this and, 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 and accomplish that thing. So I, I really like that approach. And, 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 uh, and then also, too, you never lose. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. You know, it's, it's when you're always winning. <laughs> it's like competition is just surviving. That. That's yeah. how Laird well, sets it yeah. up. I just yeah. have to survive it. But right I do there, like yeah. the I do like a comp competition. Like okay, if you you know if we want to be if you have a competitive guy, you just go to a mount a cliff and you just go up and whoever jumps the highest is the winner. So I like that kind of stuff because then it's real defined. You're just it's a real pure thing. If you're willing to go further than anyone else, then you, you know, it's, it's like the last man standing, you know, the victory through attrition. I always, I do appreciate that competitive aspect. All right, Gabby's kind of rolling her eyes. Is it, <laughs> or she's being quiet. She's being very loudly quiet. Come on, Chip, let's hear it. All right. <laughs> well, it's been a lot, I mean, I, I have no comparison to the three of you, but I, I was a pretty good swimmer at one time, and, um, it wasn't winning the race so much to me. It, at a certain level of being an athlete, I think it's the art form. It's the art form of that butterfly stroke. It's just beautiful. It doesn't hurt. It's not hard to do. It's a flow. And ultimately, that brought me far more satisfaction than actually winning the race, which I kind of heard through Laird. It's, it's, it's a beauty. It's a beautiful thing. Joe, do you even know what they're talking about? Okay, I didn't think so. No, I'm just kidding. I think, you know, I, I mean, I've known, been with Laird for almost 25 years, so I actually, Laird's so competitive that he would rather risk his life than, like, lose to a man-on-man -on -man sport, I think is sort of it. But um, I... Can't deny that. I have to agree, though, with Chip, is, like, you go about through... creativity. <laughs> yeah. I just want to express myself, yeah, right. Um, I think there's a, a side, too, where you you go through this thing and you pursuit of, of excellence, you know, fine-tuning. I wish I was a musician for that reason. But then I think when you compete long enough, what you start to realize is, no, it's about me trying to be my best self. So you guys experience this in business or what have you, where it's important to pay attention to what's going on around you. But I feel like the more you keep focusing on what it is you're trying to achieve, that ends up being... That liberates you beyond feeling competitive or threatened by other people. And so I think there's levels to it. And hopefully you get to the place where it's about how much you can create or make. And if other people are kicking ass, that you have the ability to look over and go, man, they're kicking ass. Great job. So I think there's different levels of uh, being competitive. Joe, what about you? 
for me, I, I'm I'm listening to everybody. I'm just thinking. For me, you I just like, didn't completely confuse you. Like what? <laughs> no, I I like to just put it out. First of all, I'm not I'm not surfing 150 foot waves. I'm not winning the Olympics. Like I'm, it's not me, right? So didn't build a multi billion dollar. But for me, I just put it out there. I'm gonna change a million lives, and then I just put it on me, right? I, and and so I have to deliver that every day when when there's a pandemic or whatever. I'm going to change 100 million lives. Now it's on me. And so I'm co just competitive with myself. But then Tough Mudder shows up, right? And so I'd be lying to you if I didn't say, well, you know, I, 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 I fly into Vancouver and somebody says, oh, is that like Tough Mudder? That just drives me nuts, <laughs> right? So, so um, I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't competitive. That was part of the drive. But I never stopped thinking I'm going to change 100 million lives. So, so I don't know if I answered the question well or not, but, but I'm competing with myself. Well, and that's, yeah, that's where I wanted to kind of go at the end of the day, particularly, you know, we're all moving through our lives and we're moving through different stages of our lives and doing different kinds of sports and, you know, saying, well, I did as well as I did last year. I did better, you know, than I did last year, that that can be, uh, that can be a victory as well. Well, I think too, I think at the end, it's, it's a competition with death, that at the very end of it all, that the, 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 the thing is about death and that death is the, you know, and you're competing with death and, you know, if you win or lose, I mean, you want to live. And so you just keep trying to beat death until eventually you don't and then death wins. <laughs> I'm gonna, so, out, I'm gonna outlive that's you. The, that's the pinnacle, buddy. You. That's the pinnacle. I mean, well, Pete, we're not, none of us, Peter's gone now, but we're not gonna outlive Peter. I mean, you know, he's got, gonna go. IVs. Yeah, I interviewed a guy who works with Peter, Sergey Young, he must live to 200, so we're all. And then Gabby said, you know, this. that means we'll have to be together for 170 years. <laughs> I go, wow. I don't know about this longevity stuff. <laughs> All right, well, so uh, we did run over program a little bit, so I, yeah, well, that means zero, we're out of time, okay. But um, I just, I wanna ask one question, which is how you, what you guys learned about yourselves and each other uh, in 2020, and what advice in particular, the, you know, the Atlas Society, we engage young people with the ideas of Ayn Rand, what did you learn about yourself, and what would you tell young people that are here today, that are watching us around the, the world, uh, to equip them for the challenges. You know, as, as Peter said, th th this is just a, you know, kind of dress rehearsal of, of the challenges that are going to come. What are you, what are you, what's your advice? Go ahead, Chip. Well, I think that um, I, my advice would give them if they kind of fall into the uh, socialism, collectivism, um, kind of being mediocre, being part of the group, they're going to miss out on a whole life of, of finding out everything that they can be as a human being. That's great. I, I, th I think, you know, for me, what I've learned is that I really appreciated, for whatever reason, maybe it was growing up in the Caribbean or whatever, is just being able to view things and form my own opinion. And so really encourage them to be, when it gets crazy like it has been, just slow it down and understand try to see what you're seeing. Because we were talking about it earlier, it's impossible to know what all the truths are, but I think just paying attention and seeing certain things and going, that doesn't actually feel like it makes sense. Or like Peter was saying, don't watch the news. I think somehow cultivating, continuing to cultivate your intellect and your point of view, um, because again, to Chip's point, that'll be what you take through in your life. And of course, the obvious, and I'm Laird and I are pushers of this, and obviously Joe's the king pusher of it, your health, like your relationships and your health and like everything else. And we don't need, let's not get sick or, you know, as a reminder, like, let's just take care of ourselves. You know, it's important. I'll say what I say. Um, well, first of all, I have a New Year's resolution. It's the same one every year. Um, has been laugh more, have more fun. Um, and, and at the end, you got to, but you have to believe. You know, you believe all things are possible to the believers. You got to be a believer. You got to believe you can. You got to believe it's going to be okay. Um, you, you just have to believe. That's just the, you know, that's the number one. I met a little girl. Um, she came over the house and, and, uh, and, and her little brother said, oh, he's got a monster truck. And she goes, oh, so you got a monster truck? And I go, yeah. She goes, 
well, let me see it. And I go, well, it's down the garage. She goes, you know, because now as I get a little older, I just don't believe everything someone tells me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I go, but you have this one little thing you have to understand is that you're going to have to believe at times in things that you don't get to see. And I go, that's called faith. And she goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, there's a thing where you don't get to see it. You don't get to know it's there, but you somehow you have to believe it's there. And, uh, and then I go, and that's what you need to work on. That kind of perplexed her for a little while. But, you know, it's she, about she was, believing. She was eight, and it's true. Yeah. I saw it. She's radical. Yeah. <laughs> I would say um, gratitude over resentment. I um, When things are going bad any day, uh, I just have gratitude that, you know, I'm not in World War II. I'm, I'm not missing... Uh, fingers and limbs. I've got four healthy children, um, and I never resent that. Some, you know, Laird is better looking. Gabby's cooler. Uh, Chip is worth billions. I, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> Maybe a little. <laughs> well, gratitude. You just take all the kids and torture them for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> take it out on them. A little sadism combined with gratitude. It works. Um, well, so I would just love to end with knowing. You know, where can we? What can we do to help? Where can we learn more about what you're doing and stay connected with you? Go ahead, Joe. Uh, just send an email, joe at spartan.com. Send me your kids. And, uh, <laughs> we're I mean, good to go. Imagine if you didn't have all this free time, you wouldn't be able to get a hold of these kids. I have nothing to do right now. <laughs> and follow his awesome Instagram account, too. That's right. Laird doesn't really do, I do Laird's social media, but... Uh, People tell me, hey, that was a really good post. And I'm like, really? It was. All right. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> I have a podcast. It's called The Gabby Reese Show. And, uh, yeah, the, I met Gabby Reese. Yeah. <laughs> or Laird Hamilton, actually. <laughs> um, I'm old school. It's chipwilson.com. <laughs> And, of course, you can follow Chip at the Atlas Society because we will be continuing to bring his story and uh, have a live webinar with him for long. So, anyway, thank you all for coming. Thanks for taking all of the precautions and uh, for all you do to support the Atlas Society. We really, really appreciate you. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Woo. Yeah.